for news agents. I heard the comments here. I heard the comments earlier you was making about Suella, some of the comments she made earlier this week. And I don't actually believe that these Islamists have got control of our country. But what I do believe is they've got control of Khan and they've got control of London. And again, this stems with Khan. He's 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 actually given our given our capital city away to his mates. Beware. Because if you let Labour in through the back door, expect more of this and expect our cities to be taken over by these lunatics. The unmistakable voice of Lee Anderson and the Khan he's talking about is Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. Lee Anderson has now been suspended from the Conservative Party for not apologising for what he said, even though apparently it wasn't Islamophobic or racist. Today on the News Agents, we've got the first extended interview with the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, What does he make of Lee Anderson, those comments, the leadership shown by the very top of the Conservative Party, and has he got the policing of London wrong? Welcome to the newsagents. It's John. It's Emily. And I'm not going to be in the least bit gleeful about the fact that Lewis isn't here because he's on holiday in Mexico. Have a nice time, Lewis. Always on holiday. I think we're going to hear a lot of tequila jokes and maybe some sombrero jokes as the week goes on. Exactly. Yeah. But let's pick up with what's unfolded over the weekend. Uh, Lee Anderson on GB News sounding off about Khan and his mates who he's given control of the city to um, and all the rest of it that has led to him being suspended eventually from the Conservative Party. The whip has been withdrawn, but we're told it was withdrawn because he didn't apologise, not because of what he'd said, even though it seemed to say that All Muslims were kind of radicals and that Sadiq Khan, the elected mayor, had given the city of London over to his mates, these radicals. Look, I think there are senior Conservative politicians tying themselves in knots now over how to respond to Lee Anderson, who, as you say, has now had the whip removed. He is no longer a sitting Conservative MP. Don't forget... His fall from grace has been pretty steady over the last two months. He was the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party when 2024 began. But over the weekend, we have we had Oliver Dowden, the deputy prime minister, who wasn't quite able to call out those remarks as racist, just said that he had been removed from the Tory party because he was unable to apologise. We've had Rishi Sunak saying that they were not acceptable and they were wrong, but he has dismissed claims of racism, anti-Muslim racism, in the Conservative Party and said he just wants to take the heat out now. I want to start with the developments over the weekend, given the comments made by former Conservative Party Deputy Chairman Lee Anderson. His subsequent suspension from the party, has the Conservative Party got Islamophobic tendencies, Prime Minister? No, of course it doesn't. And I think it's incumbent on all of us, especially those elected to Parliament, not to inflame our debates in a way that's harmful to others. Lee's comments weren't acceptable they were wrong and that's why he's had the whip suspended how do you account for lee anderson's comments and your decision to suspend him well i said his clearly his choice of words wasn't acceptable it was wrong and that's why the whip was suspended words matter especially in the current environment where tensions are running high and i think it's incumbent on all of us to choose them carefully how frustrating is it that he hasn't apologized for those comments i said look the, the most important thing is that people realise that the words they use in a situation that we're in now where said tensions are running higher than I think any of us would like and my priority is to try and take the heat out of this situation. I think that's what... <laughs> you can just imagine uh, the meeting that Rishi Sunak has had with his advisers and the word that has gone out to all cabinet ministers who may be doing media interviews. Words matter. He was wrong. Words matter. He was wrong. Choose our words with care. He was wrong. It's interesting, isn't it? Because once you've said words matter and then you're asked if it was racism or if it was anti-Muslim or if it was Islamophobic, you kind of have to then engage with the things that you're being asked. You can't just kind of go, well, no, it was just wrong. Because it sounds as if, as you say, they are trying not to confront what is staring them in the face, which was that Lee Anderson, who says he was clumsy with his words, might not have been 
clumsy with his words, might have deliberately chosen something that he thought would be a dog whistle to his own voters and to voters more widely within the Conservative Party. And that is a really uncomfortable place now for the Prime Minister to be in. Not that they had a rogue MP who, you know, was a bit sort of sloppy or careless, but that they had somebody who knew what he was doing, who wanted to inflame, who went straight for the jugular that he thought would please people that he wants to vote for them. You know, there is a very central part of this and it's kind of, you know, it takes me back to parenting when the children were small and they've done something wrong. It's not good enough that they apologise. You've got to understand what it is they have done wrong. And with Lee Anderson, the Conservative Party is saying, just apologise. But for what? Well, it doesn't matter. You've just done something wrong. Just apologise. And we don't know. Rishi Sunak won't spell it out. Oliver Dowden won't spell it out. And certainly Mark Harper, the transport secretary, wouldn't spell it out when he was with uh, Nick Ferrari this morning. I think what he said was profoundly wrong and he shouldn't have said it. And that's why he's had the whip taken away. You know, Nick, from our previous conversations, I think Sadiq Khan's record in London is terrible. It's particularly terrible on transport. That's what we should be attacking him on. We shouldn't be saying things that are not true and that are wrong. And Lee was wrong to say those things. He was given the chance to retract and apologise. He didn't do so. That's why firm leadership took place and he's had the whip taken away and he's not in the Conservative Parliamentary Party anymore. And they were racist and or Islamophobic. They're well, they were wrong. I'd be very clear about it. But I'm were not they racist get in. or is I'm not. I'm not, I've been asked this question, I'm not getting into an argument about what sort of comments they were. They were wrong. In my book, wrong is a strong word. He shouldn't have said them. Uh, and he was wrong. Spare a thought for little Mark Harper, who was sent out on his birthday to carry on saying the phrase, it, it was, was wrong. wrong, over and over again. What was wrong? What was wrong? Tell us what was wrong about what Lee Anderson said, which is not what they are doing yet. Yeah, we're going to hear... Before we go to Sadiq Khan, from a former Nottingham MP, Anna Subri, who paints a picture of what Lee Anderson was like with other parties before he became a Conservative MP. And she puts the blame at those who ended up selecting Lee Anderson whilst knowing entirely where his views lay on race. Well, joining us now is Anna Subri, who was a Conservative Party MP in Nottingham, uh, neighbouring Ashfield, Lee Anderson's um, constituency, Anna. And tell us a little bit about how Lee Anderson came to join the Conservative Party, because it it wasn't always um, an obvious route for him, right? Uh, absolutely was not. So I knew of him because in 2017, obviously I was standing for Parliament in Broxstoke, but because of the state of the polls, we thought we were fairly confident that we would be able to win back the seat. And we had a good candidate in Ashfield, which is literally uh, my neighbouring seat. And so my job, along with one of my team, we ran the campaign in Ashfield and we put a lot of work and effort into it. So, of course, we knew of Lee Anderson. And at that time, he was working for Gloria, Gloria Del Piero. Labour. And, Who was a Labour MP? She was a Labour MP in Ashfield, which has been a Labour seat for many, many years. In any event... We, I didn't get to know Lee Anderson, but my campaign manager did. So when 2018 came along and there was this great fanfare that two councillors, including Lee Anderson, had defected from Labour to join the Conservative Party, there was some cause for concern. And in short, it was this. First of all, my campaign manager and others were of the firm view that he was not a Conservative. He was not a Tory. The other concern was this was as to the route by which he'd come to the Tories. And he had been effectively booted out by Labour. He'd been deselected and it was a row over travellers. And in short, he was accused of racist attitudes towards travellers He was, and he was deselected. He was therefore looking for a home. I think he was looking for a job. He was recruited by Ben Bradley, Conservative for Mansfield and Mark Spencer, who is, in my view, a good man. I like Mark Spencer, but I think he made a terrible error of judgment in this. And they signed him up. So, Anna, why do you think those senior Conservatives were prepared to ignore what they knew about his deselection from one party and welcome him in to the Conservative Party? What, what was he to them? So at that time, it was a coup, of course, because if you get people from another party, especially if it's a Labour switch to Conservatives or Conservatives to Labour, that is obviously a coup. Your opponent 
they've switched to you. They see you as the future. It's their political home. That is always a coup, whichever way that traffic flows. The other reason that people were so excited about this, of course, was that it, where it was, so it was a seat that we hope to win in the future. We damn nearly won it in 2017, by the way. And it was also this idea of taking, if you like, this right-wing working class ethic that they were trying to grow. And, of course, Anderson was pro-Brexit. And, uh, uh, of course, there was that whole time when, obviously, Corbyn was still leader of the Labour Party. He was vehemently opposed to uh, Corbyn. And he said, and again, it's all there on the Internet, that his primary reason for joining the Conservatives, leaving the Labour Party, was because he couldn't abide Jeremy Corbyn and the takeover of the far left of the Labour Party, which many people would have agreed with him about. So take us to today. What should the Conservative Party be doing about Lee Anderson now? Because it seems like if he just apologises, everything will be OK. I know. So I think you have to sort of un- unpack it all, don't you? So you say, well, what did he actually say? So you, you, we know what he said. And what view do we take of what he said? So in my view, he said those things about Sadiq Khan based, which were false in any event, but... He said those things about Sadiq Khan because Sadiq Khan is a Muslim. That is my view. So you have somebody, a member of parliament, if he had used racist language about a black person or somebody who is Jewish, the party wouldn't hesitate to expel him from the party. Apparently, if he just apologises, it'll all be forgiven. That says an awful lot about the problem that the Tory party has. Now, I heard Mark Harper on the radio. I like Mark Harper on the radio. I listened to Oliver Dowden yesterday on the television. Oliver Dowden used to work for David Cameron. And something's happened. It's like they've taken leave of their senses. And I was always bellowing at the television and the radio. God says, what's wrong with you people? This is Islamophobia. I mean, if it walks like a duck, swacks like a duck, you know, all that, that stuff. This is what it is. And they couldn't even bring themselves to say it was Islamophobic. They kept bleating out, it's wrong, it is wrong but it's Islamophobic. For God's sakes, what's happened to my old party? It's appalling. They've been taken over by the right-wing nationalists, and Lee Anderson is an absolute symbol of that. Well, we're joined now by the Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, and an extraordinary weekend, uh, Sadiq Khan. What did you make of it? What, What did you feel when you heard those words from Lee Anderson? Well, look, I I mean, both of you... uh understand there are common tropes used uh, to discriminate against a variety of minorities. There are also tropes that are used against uh, Muslims. And uh, this is a very senior conservative, and up until very recently, the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. And let me be quite clear. Uh, The words he said uh, are racist, uh, they are anti-Muslim, and they are Islamophobic. Uh, and what I fail to understand is just like it's, uh, in my view, unacceptable uh, for senior politicians to say things that are anti-Semitic, just like it is unacceptable for senior politicians to say things that are homophobic or misogynistic, why is it acceptable for someone to use language that is clearly anti-Muslim, Islamophobic and uh, racist? And the context is this, by the way, it isn't about me, it really isn't. Just four days ago, an independent organization, Tel Mama, said the increase in anti-Muslim cases is the highest over the last four months it's been since they were set up. A threefold increase, in fact, 335% over the last three or four months. And I'm afraid the comments of this man feed that sort of anti-Muslim hatred. And, And the phrase I use is, he is pouring petrol on the flames of anti-Muslim hatred. In the last few minutes, he said he's not going to apologise because that would be a sign of weakness. What do you think he's doing? Well, I'm afraid he is a good example of somebody who practices the politics of extremism, of division and of hatred. And by the way, some of these people win elections as a consequence. You both have reported famously on the election in America in 2016. We've seen what happened in Argentina. And we've seen what's happened across the uh, globe. And I'm afraid, look, uh, the Prime Minister, the leader of the Conservative Party, uh, Rishi Sunak, 
the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowd, and we heard a Cabinet Minister this morning, uh, Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary. Honestly, if they don't understand why what he said is uh, wrong, that's a big problem for us. And by the way, the media, the Conservative Party, the public, uh, donors, uh, and many others rightly, rightly called out the Labour Party and Keir's taken massive progress in ridding her party of anti-Semitism. Where's the leadership? Where's the boldness from Sunak? We heard Dowden say yesterday, the reason why the whip was suspended is because of a failure to apologize. Apologize for what? Look, if you can't identify the problem, if you don't know what the problem is, how are you gonna fix it? And I'll tell you this, uh, you know, anti-Muslim hatred, Islamophobia, and this form of racism appears to be acceptable. There's a tacit approval in the Conservative Party, the party of government, and that causes me real concern, not because of me, but because there are young people across the country, uh, there are visible minorities, there are Muslims who are thinking about putting the head above the parapet, entering public life, being a politician. I'm telling you now they're being scared off, but there are people across the country, as I speak, who are the receiving end of racism, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred, and the actions of this man and the Conservative Party aren't making that less likely to happen, they're making it more likely to happen. Are you saying that Rishi Sunak is implicitly racist and Islamophobic as well for not spelling it out what Lee Anderson said was wrong. Look, it's for him to describe uh, how he is, but I speak from personal experience as somebody who addressed these issues in my party in real time over the last two, three, four, five, six uh, years. And there are brave Tories, by the way. They've, some of them have been in touch with me privately. Some have uh, been saying things publicly over the last uh, few days. They've called it out for uh, what it is. Why is Sunak not calling it out? Now, it could be because he's just weak. Uh, that's one explanation that I've been given by uh, friends in the Conservative Party. But look, it's not good enough. It's not good enough because there are people across our country. There are our fellow citizens, neighbour, neighbours and work colleagues on the receiving end of Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred and uh, racism. We need our leaders to step up. And by the way, I publicly was singing the praises of our country when uh, a, a ethnic minority, a Hindu, became the prime minister. Notwithstanding, we're from a different tribe. He's Tory and I'm Labour because it's a wonderful thing. I'm also somebody who's incredibly proud uh, to be the only mayor, the only mayor who every year leads the Pride Parade, who every year is in Taraga Square with our Hindu community celebrating Diwali in the square, with our Sikh community celebrating Vesaki in the square, with our Jewish community celebrating Hanukkah in the square, very soon with the Irish community celebrating St. Patrick's Day, St. George's Day, and yes, Eid in the square as well. Uh, and I'm somebody who's been proud of my uh, religious uh, belief, but I've kept that as a private issue it's... because I've tried to be a mayor for all Londoners. Sadiq, what we're often told is that Lee Anderson and others in his party, uh, Suella Braverman, um, many of the commentators that you'll hear on GB News are saying it as it is, that they are not scared to use the language that their own voters, that many people in the country would share, that all they're doing is trying to bring politics into a place where other people are. When you hear that argument used, what do you think? I mean, has something shifted or what? Look, there are basically, in my view, two sorts of politicians. Uh, there are those politicians that play on people's fears, genuine fears sometimes, but they play on their fears. And there are those politicians that address people's fears, sometimes genuine uh, fears. But if you repeat a trope, you may have had on the doorstep, uh, Muslims taking over the, the country, the Islamification of our society, sleeper cells, and I could repeat some other tropes, but I'd rather not to about Muslims or about the Jewish community or about women or about the LGBT plus community. You're not making things better by claiming to be uh, somebody who's repeating this. What you should be doing is addressing some of the concerns people are genuinely raising. So, for example, if the concern is there are lots of marches taking place in our great city, people showing support for uh, what's happening to the Palestinians, uh, pro-Palestinian marches, explain, listen, the mayor as a politician doesn't dictate to the police what they can and can't do. Because if he today tells the police which marches to allow, which marches not to allow, what's to stop a politician tomorrow telling the police who to arrest, who to charge, 
who to prosecute? What's the politician telling the judge who to find guilty or not guilty? What I'd hope a senior member of the Conservative Party, what I would hope that those who you know echo these tropes to do instead was to explain the separation of powers, to explain the wonderful joys of operational independence of our uh, policing. You both experienced firsthand the consequences when people play on people's fears. It leads to people being elected who divide our communities. And what I've tried to do over the last eight years, and judge me on my record, is bring our city together. I'm proud of our diversity. I think it's a strength, uh, not a weakness. I'm somebody who's proud, yes, to be a, a Muslim, but the idea that our city has been, you know, governed in a certain way because I'm Muslim is not just offensive, it's Islamophobic. But what do you make then of, uh, you know, you see a protest, which, yeah, absolutely, everyone's got the right to protest, but also when it becomes intimidatory for the other community that feels on the receiving end of it. Or you see Tower Bridge being shut because a group of pro-Palestinian protesters have taken it over. Or you see from the river to the sea projected along oh. the side of Big Ben, which a lot of Jewish people would find deeply offensive. That is the charge that Lee Anderson is kind of, you know, whipping up, if you like, by saying his mates have taken over the city. I have nothing to do with the City of London Police. I'm not in charge of the City of London Police. Put aside operational independence uh, uh, and so forth. So that's the first point. So that's an issue to raise with the City of London uh, uh, Corporation. The but the, mar election, the marches happen in wider I'll, I'll London. Do that. I'll do, no, but that, that, you're right to raise that, John, because that's been raised over the last 24, 48 hours. So that's the first one, because it's really important to rebut misinformation with the facts. That's the first distinct uh, point. The wider point you raised is a really important point. I've spoken to friends, neighbours and colleagues who are scared to come into uh, our great city on Sundays because they feel uh, frightened because they, they're, they're Jewish, uh, but also some words uh, they find deeply offensive and scares them. Now, the point I make is, look, park for a second the right to free speech. We can have a discussion about the jurisprudence. If you know something you say causes offence, hurt and fear, don't say it. Don't say it. Be cognizant of the impact it has on your friends, neighbours and colleagues. By the way, they'll still be your friends, neighbours and colleagues after this conflict uh, ends. So bear in mind, you want to carry on having great relations with them. The second point I'd make, the police in real time are reviewing all the time how they uh, are police in relation to not just specific examples of anti-Semitism, incitement hatred and uh, crimes taking place on the protest, but also in hindsight, could they th do things uh, differently? The job of being in charge of our police service is shared between myself and the Home Secretary. You will remember the former Home Secretary, the last one, trying to tell the police to ban the pro palestinian marches over the course of Armistice Weekend. You'll remember the opinion piece that Swallow Brotherman uh, wrote, wrote, and you'll, you'll remember, in fact, what it led to is a peaceful march that weekend from those who are pro-Palestine, mm. but a violent march that weekend from those supporting far right groups. I guess the and point, Sadiq, point... though, isn't isn't the point that, of course, police have operational independence, but you are the mayor of London and therefore you must shoulder responsibility for the atmosphere that is or isn't created on these days. And if you're sitting here, you know, three months on saying, you know, yes, don't use hate words or don't use hate language, still, I guess it suggests that you failed up to a point to tell those people to stop, right? I mean, these things are still going on and people are still feeling intimidated. Well, look, I, I make this point. I've been quite clear from when the marches first happened. It's not three months on from when they first uh, happened. And it's not, there's no excuse for using language that is hateful. The police are making arrests when people you know, break the uh, uh, law. The police are taking action. There's been many prosecutions as a consequence of those protests in London. Those same protests take place, by the way, in Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow, across the uh, country. Protest is an intrinsic part of our democracy. Yes, you may have a right to use language, uh, you know, in, in the way that you are, but the way you're using it is having a, an impact on our Jewish friends, neighbours and colleagues that they feel scared. And it can't be right that people feel uh, scared. And all of us, not just me, the Prime Minister, Home Secretary, the leader of the opposition, all of us have responsibility to unite our communities rather than dividing them. Can we just look at a couple of other issues with you, Sadiq, before you go? It's going to be a big week for um, a by-election, Rochdale. I mean, what would you do if you were a resident of Rochdale right now? How would you vote? What, what, what on earth are they expected to do? 
Well, good question. So I think firstly, because I believe in democracy, I believe in voting and other sacrifices made, I would go and vote. I may waste my... I may, I, I may spoil my ballot paper uh, because, the, frankly, frankly, frankly speaking, none of the candidates putting themselves forward uh, to me uh, should be in, in the Houses of Commons. And so I would go and go to the you know, ballot polling station uh, and I'd probably spoil my ballot paper. Would you be more Brexit. scared of George Galloway or more scared of Azhar Ali? Or... Well, I've not seen the consequences of... Uh, 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 you know, Azhar Ali, but I've seen the consequences of Galloway, what he did in, in East London and also in Bradford. But, you know, Azhar Ali should not be in the House of Commons. I, I think they're both unfit to be parliamentarians. And that's why I spoil my ballot paper. And can I ask you one other question, which is, I guess, where we ended last week? I mean, we've got the Israeli government saying it is still mulling how to evacuate Rafah before a potential invasion. And we've got the SNP saying they want to come back with a meaningful vote now so that they get to have their vote unimpeded, uninterrupted, as it was last week. If the Israeli government goes ahead, or even if it doesn't, would you encourage the Speaker to allow a meaningful vote for the SNP so that MPs can call for a ceasefire? You know, I understand the importance of of motions and debates in, in Parliament. They are important. They're important because the world watches. But also, they're important to show people across the country that our parliamentarians do listen. They're not, you know, the speaker's job is to be an impartial chair. I'm somebody who, who's only voted Conservative once in my life, and that was when I nominated John Burke to be the speaker because I thought he could be an impartial speaker. When I was in the House of uh, Commons, even though he was a Tory, Lindsay Hoyle was a Labour MP, but I think he has been an impartial speaker over the last uh, few years. Clearly. What happened last week in the House of Commons was a poor reflection, in my view, on our parliament. And I think there's got to be a way for uh, those SNP MPs who feel as if their voices weren't heard, for their voices to be heard. Is I think the SNP only get a fraction of opposition days compared to the Labour Party and others. And I can understand why if you're an MP you only gets three opposition day debates, you're frustrated. You didn't get your chance to have a vote on your uh, motion. City Calm, thanks so much. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, stay well. <laughs> Take Thanks. care. Do you accept your comments that you've been called a racist from your party? Oh, no, I've got a phone call, mate. Has your party got a racism Hello. problem, Mr Anderson? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's outside now. Are you going to join the Reform Party, Mr Anderson? Okay. His phone's going to go in a minute, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I can't talk. I'm on the phone. Yeah, exactly. So that was Lee Anderson being asked if he was going to join the Reform Party. And we've already heard from Richard Tice today, who said that... Who's the head of the Reform Party. He's the head of the Reform Party. He said, never has Westminster been more out of touch with where normal people are on this issue. And whilst he won't comment on whether um, Lee Anderson is or isn't going to join, that you know, he's got their numbers or they've got his numbers and they can all talk if they want. And so what is so interesting about that, because I think that helps you understand and explains why Rishi Sunak, Mr Dowden, Mr Harper won't say a word about Islamophobia. They just say he's wrong and that if he only apologised nicely, he could come back because I think the Conservative Party thinks that, oh, my God, even worse than Lee Anderson is the prospect that loads of Conservative Party members agree with him and voters agree with him and are going to vote for reform at the next election, which could be catastrophic for the Conservative Party. They're caught in this trap, aren't they, at the moment, it seems to us, that Lee Anderson is the man that they've always hailed as speaking it like it is, talking to real people, expressing the views of real people. Now, you heard what Sadiq Khan said in that interview with us. He said, you have to decide whether you're going to bend towards people's conspiracies and their tropes and their racism or whether you say, actually, that's not how it is. But I think the Conservative Party is slightly trapped because on the one hand, they feel that there is this sort of political imperative to call him out and say, we've got to suspend him. We've got to say he's done wrong. We've got to ask him to apologise. But on the other hand, they're terrified that he might be isolated and taking voters with him if he goes to the Reform Party or stays at home or whatever. And so they are slightly caught in this catch-22 where 
part of them, I think, even at the top, thinks, oh, maybe he knows something about voters that we don't. Of course. And that has always been the guiltiness of the the well-to-do Tory MP who worries that I'm not really connected to the ordinary man and woman. And, you know, in the past, if you look at the role that Norman Tebbit has played in the Conservative Party or Dennis Skinner played in the Labour Party. Oh, they are the authentic... Get on your bike. They're all yeah. authentic voices and we've got to give them uh, their space. Or John the, Prescott, I suppose. Yeah, you know, or John who Prescott. Who famously punched, somebody punched a voter in the face and got away with it because the general perception was that well he's like us yeah you know i would have wanted to do the same even if i hadn't done it so i think that the problem that rishi sunak has got though is that i'm sure a conservative campaign hq they want to shut this down as fast as possible they don't want to be talking about lee anderson and whether he's a Islamophobe or a racist and all the rest of it. They want to talk about all the other issues they've got. Transport on their, on in the North. Transport in the North. You know, the money from HS2. They're not going to be able to move on from that while they're giving such woefully inadequate answers about just saying it's wrong, it's wrong. I'm not going to say what's wrong, yeah. it's just wrong. And that's a very strong word indeed. And meanwhile, Richard Tice is waiting for his phone to ring as well. And Good. you can just see Richard Tice sitting there rubbing his hands together. We'll be back tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 